Before our opening prayer, we'll sing 397. 397. 397. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he hath given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. In heaven no drooping nor pining. No wishing for elsewhere to be. God's light is forever there shining. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. The angels so sweetly are singing up there by the beautiful sea. Sweet chords from the gold harps are ringing. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. Let's bow together. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we bow before thee in all humility, praising thy high and holy name. For thou art holy above all, the creator of all things, and our Redeemer, who sent your only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins, that we might have hope of eternal life. Father, we're thankful for the blessings that we receive each day. We know that all the good things that we have come from thee, Father, our food and shelter and clothing, our friends and our family who encourage us, this congregation of our friends and spiritual family. We're so thankful, Father, to be part of a kind and loving congregation. We're thankful, Father, for the true comfort that we can get from the study of the word and from the worship together and pray that you help us to gain strength in hard times from thy word and from prayer and from our relationship with thee, Father. We're thankful, Father, for the elders here who shepherd the congregation, for the deacons who serve, for Brother Dale and his ministering to us and his preaching of thy word strengthens us. Father, we're thankful for the progress of those who are, have been ill and are getting better and pray that you continue to be with Glenn Fan and for all those who were mentioned, for Sue Simpson's daughter and family, and especially for Quinn at this time as he continues with difficulty. Father, we pray that you be with Evelyn Avant and her upcoming procedure. And we pray also for Sue Bowen and her family and their loss. Help us, Father, to always appreciate the time that we have with our families and with our friends knowing that one day we will all pass from this life. Father, we pray for those who are struggling, struggling spiritually to open themselves up to the healing comfort of thy word. Help us to always be an encouragement and a strength to them. We pray for those who fight for peace and liberty 
far from home for our elected officials that they might make good and right decisions that they would follow thy word and all that they do and help us father to follow thy word and have strength to make good decisions in our lives pray for all of those father who are struggling with the illness uh, across the land and across the world and pray that they would find a, a way to uh, end the suffering that's going on because of that Father, help us to humbly seek thy ways and have strength and self-control and overcome sin in our lives and to grow in love to help those in need and to grow in knowledge that and commitment to thy word that we will one day have a home with thee in heaven. And may our worship this hour be in accordance with thy will and to thy glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we take the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 502, 502. 502. To set the feast divine, the bread, the fruit of the vine, and saints commune before the shrine in the supper of the Lord. May we the Lord discern His death our holy concern. We feast in faith His coming yearn in the supper of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we're grateful for the privilege and opportunity we have to gather around your table this morning. We're mindful now, Father, of the bread which represents the body of Christ as he hung on the cross, that we might have forgiveness of our sins. May we partake of it in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. 
in a likewise manner. Father, we're so blessed to be able to partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Christ. That he gave it on the cross freely that, to wash away our sins. We pray that we'll take it in a manner that's well pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name. Before we give back a portion of our earnings, we'll sing number 33. 3 3. We'll sing the first verse. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your See what God had done. Let's pray. Dear God, we're so thankful to be able to live in a country that's been so blessed by you. We pray, Father, as we give back into that treasure, we'll do it cheerfully and with a good heart. And we pray, Father, that these funds will be used in a rightful manner that will spread the gospel throughout our community and throughout the world. Forgive us, Father, when we listen, we should be in Jesus' holy name. You would go ahead and mark in your song books number 214, 214. This will be our song after the lesson. Two, one, four. After you've marked that, you'll grab one of the blue folders and here's number 21, 21. Two, one. Ms. Gavini, would you please stand? Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how he loves me, how I love him. He is risen, he is coming, Lord, come quickly. Too bad. 
Certainly good to see you this morning, and we're glad to be able to be back together both in person and on Facebook Live and on our phone line. If you're on the phone line and you've been having any difficulty, some have said there was some static on Thursday, and certainly want to know if you've had that problem, please let some of us know so that we can check on that. It's hard to do it from this end sometimes because we're not listening. Uh, so please uh, check and uh, let us know if that is the case. Also, we will not be having class on Wednesday morning. There will be a regular Bible study Wednesday night, but no on Wednesday morning. Jackie and I are going off for a few days. We'll be back next weekend uh, celebrating 41 years anniversary, and we're just going to go off for a few days. So I hope that you will keep us in your prayers. David and Martha are down on the coast, so certainly hope you'll keep them in your prayers. We know that their storms are brewing and approaching, and uh, we certainly hope that all goes well, and certainly it's not too serious, maybe more than a rainmaker, and we may get a little bit of that before the week's over as well. So uh, let's keep one another in our prayers. Second Corinthians chapter 7, the fruit of repentance. This morning, we looked at 1 Corinthians in our auditorium class, and we discussed the problem of sexual immorality there in 1 Corinthians 5. And actually, as you begin chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, we said there are two problems. The first problem was the sin that had been committed, and the second problem was the church that had ignored it. And Maybe that's a, a, a good title for a lesson in and of itself. But the fact of the matter is, it seems like the latter of those two things was what Paul addressed as being the greater. And that was the fact that the church had not mourned it, the church had not grieved it, and the church had arrogantly, in many ways, just simply accepted it. Sin can never be something that we just simply accept as the norm. No matter where it comes from, no matter what it is. And if it's that of a public nature, we certainly can't ignore it. As we're going into the month of September and October, as I mentioned in class, we're going to be addressing some moral issues facing the church and facing our world. I'm not one, as I said in class, that gets into moral debates, or rather a political debates, but I think we can deal with moral issues, certainly without naming names and without trying to cause division in a way in which we say, well, I'm this way or I'm that way. And so we want to look at what the Bible says about issues such as gay marriage, homosexuality, abortion. We want to be able to address those things so that we can all understand where the Bible stands so that we can say as children of the living God, that's where we stand. And as such, then we can certainly do those things that are right and strong in accordance with the Word of God. In many ways, when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 8, is where our text will begin. When he says there in verse 8, For uh, though I made you sorry with a letter, I did not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceived that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. 
And then he continues on. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorrow after a godly manner, that you might receive uh, damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yes, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. What revenge. In all things you have approved yourself to be clear in this manner. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for the cause that I had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong. But that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. When you look at these things that are being outlined here. And you see what's going on. And you talk about sin. And let's be honest. When we talk about problems today. Certainly with pandemics and unrest and things that are happening in our world today. The greatest of all of this. As children of God, we understand is sin. Because sin is that pivotal point that separates us from God. And if we are separated from God, we are separated from our only hope of leaving this life and going into the next life successfully. And so the message is simple. Whether it is from ones like Elijah, who... Uh, we look at John, he, as I was going to say before, in many ways he looked and, and it was much like the prophet Elijah. Uh, and you see, of course, John's diet was uh, a little bit different probably than most. And that uh, he ate bugs for lunch. Locust to be technical. But when you look at that and you understand the message was pretty much the same whether we're looking at the prophets of old, the prophets of new, or it needs to be God's people today. And that is, sin will cause you to lose your soul. And this morning we talked about from 1 Corinthians 5, that of a public nature. That's certainly something that needs to be dealt with in a public way. And then there are those of a private nature that we can certainly deal with in a private way between us and God. But at all times willing to confess a need to repent. A need to get ready, if you will. Again, we've talked about being sorry. What does it mean to truly be sorry? Growing up, many of us heard the same thing. Are you sorry for what you did? Or are you sorry that you got caught for what you did? You see, because there's a difference. There's a difference with man and there's a difference with God. So what is it that leads one to truly, truly be repentant? To truly recognize sin for the ugliness that it is. And to understand. When you look at the Apostle Paul and you see how clearly he's telling us to get ready. The Jews certainly saw themselves in a covenant relationship with God. They were God's chosen people. And many today that are Jews still look at themselves as God's chosen people, meaning they can say and do and act in any way they want to, and somehow there's a special entrance into heaven because simply they are Jewish people. And we kind of shake our heads at that, but let me tell you, there are a lot of church folks that think the same thing about being members of the Lord's church. That think somehow, just simply because they were baptized, simply because they attend services, that they're going to have that entrance into heaven automatically because they're members of the church of Christ. And this is where we need to understand exactly what it is that Paul is talking about here when it comes to godly repentance and godly sorrow and being obedient to the things of God. 
He's telling people who saw themselves as saved that they needed to repent. Think about that for a moment. Telling folks that are saved, you need to repent. Isn't that the message we need to tell one another today? Some of the things that we can repent of, again, we do so privately. But there are those things, if they were public, that need to be repented of publicly. Sometimes there's just the need for the prayers of encouragement. That's fine as well. But of course we're talking about sin being amiss in one's life in this way. But the interesting part is oftentimes not simply the message, again, as we talked about from 1 Corinthians 5, but how people respond to the message. You see, that's also how we can understand biblical authority. We see what is said, and then we see how people respond to what's said in the inspired word. Well, the same thing's true with sin. We see those things that are said, but we can also sometimes see the arrogance with those that respond to those things that are said and how they respond. Not everyone, not even the majority, but most everyone knew this man's message. And they knew what was going on when you go back. And whether it was public or not, they knew what was going on here. When we look to John, we go back to John, and we look to John, or we look to Elijah, uh, especially when we look to John in the New Testament, and we look to Christ in the coming of the kingdom and the message that was preached and, and what was being done here and what needed to take place. The people were made to understand, here's what's real. Here's what has to happen in your life. So the people started confess, confessing their sins, wanting to be immersed in the baptism of repentance. And this this individual, such as John and even Christ and now Paul, they convicted people, listen, you need to look within yourself. Isn't that the message when we come together each and every week? Is the challenge, and if it's not presented from the pulpit, then it's a failure on, on the pulpit's part, my part. To challenge you to examine yourself, to convict yourself if that's what's necessary. That there's something amiss in my life that needs to be corrected and I need to correct it now. I've got to make sure that I've got some joy in my life. I've got to make sure that I've got some real zeal. And not to let the fear and the things of this world that are going on right now get me down to the point to where I can't even function as a New Testament child of God anymore. Because I'm so fearful of wringing my hand and afraid like chicken little that the sky is going to fall at every minute. That the devil keeps me from doing what I know I need to be doing. Not only in the world, but even in my worship to him. I need to make sure that I've added that enthusiasm. When you look at places like Matthew chapter 3, go back there and beginning in verse 7. Matthew 3 and verse 7, where when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to, to his baptism... He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the lake of fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me, mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And so when you begin to look at that, John says, this is what's going on now. But wait. Do you see what's coming? Here's what I'm doing, but wait till you see the one that's mightier than I. John was a mighty man. But Jesus was mightier, wasn't he? And when you listen to that, when you listen to Matthew 3, 7 through 10, this was said to the most righteous of Jews. And, and they said, oh no, we're saved because 
Abraham is our father. That's the arrogance. That's the self-righteousness that even children of God today need to be very cautious about. Oh, I'm a member of the Lord's church. Okay, so what are you doing in obedience to the Lord's commands? What are you doing in obedience to his way and his will? Then you look at the idea of being called out. You look at the idea of being called out. No one likes to be called out because of something that they're doing wrong. We don't like the idea to accuse anybody, especially when it's us or someone that we love or something that we love. When someone calls that out, boy, we get defensive quick. Sometimes we get very emotional. Who do you think you are? So we don't like that. When I'm challenged about my attitude or actions, it's easy for me, and maybe you don't have that problem, but it's real easy for me to go on the defensive. It's easy for me to wear my feelings very close. And then when you hurt my feelings, I go on the attack. I go on the offensive. Then, that doesn't work about just simply stating that I'm hurt. Then I kind of go on the offensive of attacking those that maybe hurt me. Don't want to do that either. And I certainly do my best to never do that. No one wants to be told that they're wrong. In a marriage, that's the last thing that we like to be told and we certainly hate to admit I'm wrong. That's a word that's difficult sometimes to say. No one wants to do that. But the truth is this. You are wrong, and probably more wrong than you even realize. I am wrong, and probably more wrong through my life than I even realize. That's why Jesus came and he suffered and died. Because we're wrong more than we realize. And so we've got to be able to understand what it is. Whether it takes a preacher, whether it takes one like the Apostle Paul, whether it takes our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that inspired word to illustrate to us, you're wrong and here's why you're wrong. Even if we don't like being called out for it, it doesn't change the wrongness of it, does it? The church in Corinth was accepting sinful behavior and coming across as if their tolerance was righteous behavior. That's what we call arrogance, folks. We can boldly say that we're, we're a very progressive. We're hearing that word now instead of liberal anymore. Have you heard that? When it comes to congregations of the Lord, we're progressive. We're progressive. And sometimes this is simply to tolerate certain behavior. Paul called them out. Remember, this was a city that, as we mentioned in class this morning, was a city that was very uh, sinful with the sexual immorality. It was very prevalent in Corinth, obviously. And when you look at the year and a half that was spent there by Paul getting that work started. It was a church that had good men, Apollos and, and, and Peter, uh, worked with the church uh, in Corinth. One would look at this church, this congregation, and say they had everything going for it. Sometimes I look at the history of congregations that I've been at, and, and, and I look at history of congregations that I, uh, in the past, have been a part of, and when they'll have homecomings and things of that nature. And I look at the list of names. And boy, you go, wow. There's some mighty men been a part of this group. There's some mighty men that have been in the pulpit and have preached. And then you get a little frightened, at least I do, or to go, wow, or intimidated. 
It's kind of like when I first started preaching, and I, I suppose it would still occur today with certain men to come and sit in the audience while I was preaching. It was like uh, 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 almost thinking, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to forget everything. Because I think they're out there, you know, giving me a critique of my lesson when indeed they're just out there like I would be trying to learn and loving me and hoping the best for me. Being an encouragement in that way. So Paul called them out. Everything going, but he called them out. But Paul uh, took the church in Corinth to task several times. Whether it was the sexual immorality, the self-centeredness that they had to the point that they didn't care about the feelings and well-beings of the members. Even spiritual class warfare uh, over who had the, the best spiritual gifts. I can speak in tongues, but all you can do is this, and I, I can do that. Over and they had several problems at Corinth that really was brought to light here in these letters. But I think there came a time where Paul said, enough is enough. And if it's an individual thing or if it's a leadership thing in the Lord's church, there should always come a time where enough is enough. We've got to get to the business of saving the law. But before we can save the law, we've got to save ourselves. We've got to make sure that we're where we need to be. That we believe what we need to believe. And are following what we need to follow. But Paul takes these brethren to task in this letter, doesn't he? And he didn't do it because he disliked them or hated them. He did it because he loved them. He loved them. What he was saddened by and what he didn't love was their sinful and sad attitude. And you look at chapter 7, beginning verse 2 of 2 Corinthians, where he says, Receive us. We've wronged no man. We've corrupted no man. We've defrauded no man. I speak not this <clears throat> to condemn you, for I've said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. And then he goes on there and he says, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulations. When you look at this, when you think about Paul, how much he loved them. When someone points out a wrong attitude or action that we may be exhibiting, their relationship to me has a lot to do with how I receive it. And I'm sure that's the same with you. Our relationship has a lot to do with how we receive criticism. And so when we look at this and we see they seem to accept it uh, in a way that brought about the desired repentance that God wanted because of their admiration, because of their trust, because of their faithfulness in Paul. As Christians, we always need to realize we've got room to grow. I don't care who you are, I don't care how old you are, you got room to grow today. You've got room to grow. But the only way we're going to grow in some area is in when we're called out for wrong behavior. And it causes us to examine our harmful way. The second thing when we talk about, and the title of our lesson is the fruit of repentance. Here in chapter 7 and verse 10. Where he says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. See, if you're just simply sorry because, whoop, I didn't get away with it. I got caught. Somebody found out about it. We see that a lot of times in public figures, don't we? They get called out. But if they hadn't been called out over their behavior, they never would have accepted that behavior. They never would have admitted. And even sometime when there's proof of such behavior, they still arrogantly try to justify it or say that it didn't happen. Say that they've been misquoted or misunderstood. 
No one likes to be called out. But when we look at what Paul is saying here, and I read this passage keeping that in mind, you know, when you look at this, when it comes to yielding to what God has put forth, understanding that I, that means I've got to change according to the things that God has put forth to be what God wants me to be. You see, godly sorrow, godly sorrow admits the wrong, feels the pain, and then chooses to change. That's what godly sorrow is all about. That's what it's all about. Admits the wrong, feels the pain, sees the need for change. And when we understand that and embrace that, then we begin looking at things in a different light. Maybe differently than the world. And I, I mentioned that Wednesday night as we're looking at Galatians. Not getting so wrapped up in the social issues of our time that we ignore the spiritual or the scriptural issues that we need to be addressing. We need to understand what does the Bible say? Am I living according to that standard? Or am I living more according to what the world is dictating that I should think, that I should do, the way I should act? That's not a child of God. That's acting like the arrogant Corinthian brethren who said, well, I'm, I'm a Jew. Or the arrogant church member that says, well, I'm a member of the church of Christ. That's not handling it with true sorrow and repentance. Repentance is not feeling bad. Repentance is all about changing. You ask anybody that's involved in sin and normally when they commit that sin, they feel bad. A drunkard will feel bad because he just can't seem to stop drinking. So many different bad habits, the person will tell you, I feel bad. I've heard so many confessions out there in the world over the years and being a chaplain. I've heard so many different folks confess about things when they were caught. And they were sitting in back of a police car. Oh, I feel so bad about that. I know I shouldn't have stole that. I know I shouldn't have done that. And granted, it gives an opportunity to pursue that more with the individual. But would that behavior have continued? Maybe, maybe not. And maybe this was their wake-up call. And maybe a lot of folks get to have that wake-up call. A wake-up call. There's so many out there today that just 